In this session, we are going to be providing a short and succinct, uh, but also helpful definition and some more clarity on what we referenced in our previous session on the covenant of redemption. Make sure that you are following along in your notes where you can see broader definitions, more precise language in written form. Perhaps that would be helpful for you. But before we get there, guys, I want to share just kind of a short analogy. And so I don't know if you guys are fans, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of kind of sci-fi, specifically the, the Marvel movies. And one of the things, one of the themes that you've seen in Marvel movies is whenever they introduce like a new superhero or character, a lot of times they'll do this four to five minute montage in the beginning, explaining the background, what's going on in that character, how that character came to be. And something that I frequently hear is when we explain the gospel to somebody or we explain the Bible to somebody, we often say, well, we need to go to the beginning. We need to go to the book of Genesis. And I have nothing against that. However, as we discussed in our last session, we often have to have the proper lenses and framework to understand that. Right. And frankly, as we talk about the covenant of redemption, have you ever watched a movie and you felt like, man, I need to watch that again so I understand it a little bit better? <laughs> right. Like you can always judge a good movie by whether or not you, you can watch it twice. Right. Well, frankly, when you read through the whole Bible, perhaps for the first time, it's kind of you get that moment of, I need to read that again. Well, I think reading the Bible through a lens of the covenant of redemption, I think is helpful. Mm -hmm. Because if we want to be technical and precise, when we say, we're going to explain the gospel and I'm going to take you to the beginning, I think truly the beginning is the covenant of redemption. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And scene one, I think, is Genesis 1, right? Yeah. So if you yeah. related it to a Marvel movie, you know, the covenant of redemption would be that five minute montage explaining That's the right. background and character. And then scene one is whatever you, you so yeah. get. So, John, why don't we, before we get too much into the weeds with yeah. this, why don't you just kind of explain, refresh, yep. what do we mean by covenant in general? Yeah, we're going to do this for each one just so you can understand. And, and really, what we're trying to help you see is the difference between a conditional and unconditional covenant. So, we have uh, referenced Noahic. You have two parties involved, but God's the only one taking on the commitment here. He is saying, I will not do this Noahic again. Noahic being the covenant God made with Noah. That's right. So he will not flood the earth again, even though men and women continue to be rebellious against him. Right. So this is an unconditional covenant. And we're going to get into the conditional covenants that we see with uh, Abraham, and you're going to see it with David and, and Mosaic. We have another conditional one here, and what we mean by condition is that there are two parties who are making commitments on either side. Right. And if one fail those, um, traditionally, it, the, the idea of covenants is actually, it's, it's not new to the Bible, but the idea of it is, I'm going to use uh, the Abrahamic covenant as an example. God requires Abraham to divide these animals, to kind of cut them in half. And what was being symbolized there quickly is that if God failed to fulfill this covenant with Abraham, this is what he is committing to. And this is often what two people would do. So let's say Justin and I are going to make a commitment, like a business commitment. And what they would do is we would take a, a lamb or some doves and we would divide them in part part and then the, the, together the ceremony we would walk through those animals saying if one of us failed our commitment this covenant then this is what would happen to us we would basically die right and so there's the, the when a covenant is made it's not like hey man i have your back yeah i got you covered yeah i promise to take care of that in the bible when a covenant is being made it is a universal massive moment yeah. that you cannot take lightly yeah, right. especially when God is one of the parties involved. <laughs> That's Absolutely. right. So what we're going to do now is start reading language, and what we want you to pick up on is this language of commitments that are being made. There's yeah. parties involved. There's So as we read these scriptures, we, we want you to see we're not pressing this down into the text, right. but we're trying to help you see and pull it out of the text. So Justin, yes. why don't you start us moving over there? So the covenant of redemption is what we're covering, particularly in this episode, and people might legitimately ask, where do you guys get this? Like, Where in Scripture, what kind of language in Scripture would lead you to conclude that there is a covenant of redemption? Well, quite simply, the answer to that would be all of the language in the Bible that talks about things that occurred, in particular amongst the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, before the world began. We're going to look at some particular passages here in a minute, but as Jimmy alluded to earlier, Genesis 1 is not the beginning of all things. God 
is. Like he never got started. That's and right. he existed in eternity past. He always has been. There never was a time when he was not. And God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit made a, a covenant amongst themselves. And we're going to unpack that more to save a people. And this was determined before creation ever happened, before there was time and space. So it's that kind of language in the Bible that leads us to understand that there was this covenant of redemption made in eternity past that then will be fulfilled and accomplished in time and space in the theater of the world that God has created. Yeah. So a great text for this, for what you just explained, Justin, is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. And I'm, I'm not going to read the entire section, but I do want to highlight a, a few verses where we see clearly all persons of the Trinity active within what we call the covenant of redemption, specifically verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, right? We see God the Father active there. It is God's God the Father. He has this idea, mm -hmm. right? But we also see God the Son mm -hmm. in him, speaking of Christ in verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, that Jesus went to actually accomplish this work of redemption. But also then in verse 13, in him you also, when you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with what? Or with who specifically? The promised Holy Spirit, yeah. who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Yeah. And so in that passage, we have all persons of the Godhead active in this work of redemption, specifically the covenant of right. redemption. Right. God the Father chose a people in the Son before the world began, and the Spirit would apply the work of the Son to those people. That's right. It's very clear language. Right. And then you'll see this, you'll start picking up on this language, even in the Old Testament, which will reference some of these passages. But another one I would take us to is uh, Titus uh, chapter 1, verses yeah. 2 and 3. It says this, In hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, mm -hmm. which is, again, the language of promise. Mm -hmm. You could also say, if we want to replace that word, coveted before the world began, at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of our Savior. Yeah. So you're, you, you're hearing language. Paul is actually interpreting all of the Old Testament in one reference saying this is all unfolding and was uh, foretold in a promise and a covenant before the world began. Another text, 2 Timothy 1, 9, and 10. Paul is talking about God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So there again is that language. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ to abolish death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So we'll unpack this more later, but there you actually have the covenant of grace as well showing up on the scene, not conditioned upon us, but conditioned upon what Christ has done, where we see Jesus accomplishing something applied to us by faith, grounded in grace, in order that that covenant of redemption would be ultimately accomplished, namely the salvation of God's elect. That's right. Yeah. Not to jump the gate here, but I think very practically what we have to realize here is that the covenant of redemption also gives us a framework to understand that our God is a proactive God, not That's a right. reactive That's God, really right. that before the foundations of the earth were laid, before That's any right. cell of a human existed, God planned this. God knew that he was going to redeem his people. You know, often I think uh, this is probably a good response to kind of the open theist argument that God is kind of merely a master chess player, that he really is not sure of the, the great outcomes. And I just think that flies in the face of what we see here in Ephesians 1 and the other scriptures that you guys have referenced, right. that, no, God is a proactive God. Mm. Right. God does not wait for humans to act and say, well, then I wonder how I should respond to that. God is the one who initiates, he bestows, he gives, he is the actor, the sustainer. And that's so important for us to, I think, remember specifically as we think about this covenant. I mean, some other passages that are pretty key, I think, for us in this understanding occur in John's gospel, Yeah, where uh, John 17, the high priestly prayer, there's a lot of language there from Jesus in praying to the Father about things that were going on before the world began. That's right. And 
things that were understood between him and his father right. before the world began. In John 10, there's the charge that Jesus will reference. I, I have been given a charge by my father that I would lay my life down and take it back up again for the sheep, for my people. Right. John 6, 37, John 10, 28, 29. There were a people that belonged to God the Father that he has given to the Son, mm. and the Son is going to come to save them. Like all of that is is the covenant of redemption, and it's all throughout Scripture. Right. So yeah. again, Jesus doesn't use the word covenant there, but he's referencing, he's using language by which yeah. I, I have received this from A the charge. Father. Right. I've been given something to do. That's right. I have come to fulfill my Father's will. This is, again, when we think about language and commitments, Jesus is saying, right. I have been commissioned to do this. Right. Well, the other question then, okay, so this is Jesus. It's very obvious. I've come to seek and save that which is lost. I've come to lay down my life. And I love, you know, when you don't understand covenant language, you'll miss a very important part of verse 18 that you said, this charge I have received from my Father. Amen. Well, if you can connect that back to Ephesians, you're realizing the charge came to Jesus before the world began. It wasn't, oh, great, the whole world has fallen into chaos. I'm going to commission Jesus to go do this. And mop it up. <laughs> right. That's not the language. Like yeah. you just said, he's not reactive, he's proactive. This That's is right. not a mop-up operation. It's all plan A. Right. Yeah. So this Plan is a, a being the covenant of redemption. Right. Yeah. So this is a conditional covenant. That's Christ's condition to fulfill the will of the Father to redeem right. his people. So guys, what's the what's the commitment from the Father to the mm -hmm. Son? Do we see this in scripture? This would be this would be uh, Philippians chapter 2, right? Sure. And I would say, uh, the, we were talking about this before recording, I would say that the fulfillment of the Father is the resurrection and the exaltation of the Son. That's his commitment. Uh -huh. And also to give the Son a people. That's right. And, and for the Son to have not only his people, but a new creation to inherit. Right. So I'm thinking Psalm 2, right? like verse 8. The Father is speaking to the Son, the Messiah, and he says, Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. Like, it all will belong to the Son because of what the Son has done. He has saved these people who are now his, his bride, if we're thinking about the language of Revelation, and the entire new creation, in that sense, is his inheritance. Right. That's right. That's his reward for keeping the conditions of this covenant. Yeah, and you just said a very key word, that within this covenant, we see the the motif, if you will, of obedience and reward, right? right? So right. think of a very practical ex example. If you're listening to this and you're married, you're actually very familiar with covenant, covenant language because yeah. you stood at an altar, Lord willing, before a pastor, and you, and you vowed and you committed to one another in a covenant to love and to cherish regardless of what had happened. Now, what we see tragically, obviously, in our culture is people break that covenant. Right, they are disobedient to the covenant. Perhaps they're unfaithful, or they're mistreating of their spouse. And what gets broken? Well, the reward in a marriage covenant, right, is love and peace and unity and joy and children and so on and so forth. But we're very familiar with this covenant language more than I think we like to realize. But this is what we see in the covenant of redemption: that Jesus has a very specific task to redeem God's right. people. He has a very specific thing. He has come to accomplish, mm -hmm. and there is obedience involved there, yes. and there is reward there. Yes, yeah. and we're going to get to this more later, but in order, the, the obedience piece and the, the commitments of the Son to, to obey and to do stuff, that is Him keeping the conditions of a covenant that is grounded in and dependent upon His works. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I, to even use uh, Jimmy's example, we use, we use loan, like if you buy a home, you are covenanting that you're going to pay for that. Right. And what, what is happening is you're going into debt, and right. then what's the reward once you pay the debt? The reward is you gain the home. Right. And so the fulfillment, that's the end of it. And so you see this language even within, I mean, I'll just read to you real quickly, Philippians chapter 2, it says, and being, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. Now, that's that's a really important question. Obedient to who? Who is Jesus obeying? Right? He's fulfilling he, his committing well, side. And even in Jesus, I mean, not to jump on you here, John, but in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus, it, it, truly God, truly man, he is wrestling with what lies before him. That's right. What he's about to do. What does he say? 
he's he's wrestling with the plan, and but he's saying not what I want. That's right. You know, but but your will, Father, be done. He is obeying his Father even to the point of death. That's right. Right, death on a cross. Right. So it's then, true and real obedience on the that, on the on the part of Christ. That's right. Yeah, I, yeah. And then it says, therefore, God has, this is the fulfillment side. So Jesus right. paid the debt. He earned the right, uh, the righteous status that we needed in order mm-hmm. to be in relationship with God. So he fulfilled his side of the covenant. Yeah. And this is what it says that God does. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every Amen. name. That at the name of Jesus, every needs. This is the exaltation that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So he raises them from the dead and he exalts them to his rightful place. And so you're seeing the promises or the commitments on both parties' side, mm-hmm. and then you're seeing the fulfillment on both parties' side. And yep. then the covenant is over. Right. And now, which is what we love when we talked about earlier, it's now applied. Yeah. Right. Well, we talked about th- this began. In eternity past, scene one, to use your language, Jimmy, is Genesis one. Well, what's the end of the movie? It's the book of Revelation. <laughs> but what is the language of Revelation five, for example? What are people singing? They sang a new song saying, worthy are you. They're singing to, to Christ, to the Lamb. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is that. It's That's the right. exaltation of Christ, and it is this is his inheritance, his people, and they'll reign. Amen. We will reign with him. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Acts, you hear this in Acts 2, the sermon. He says this in 32 and 33. This Jesus, God raised up, fulfillment of the promise, and of that we all witnessed, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out, this is the application, mm-hmm. This that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Mm -hmm. And so the covenant has been fulfilled, and now the benefits of the covenant are being poured out upon us. That language of benefit is huge. We we were talking about this a little bit ago before we recorded this session, that the parties, if we're going to maybe transition into that, we've already been talking about it a little bit, the parties of the covenant of redemption are God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and perhaps in a pointed way, the Father and the Son, in terms of the commitments they're going to make. But the amazing thing about the covenant of redemption is that we benefit from it. That's right. We are not one of the parties, but we benefit from the covenant of redemption, which is mind-blowing. The application of it. Yeah. It's mind-blowing. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's, if we're going to uh, start our, our descent, if you will, into the next airport, uh, that that is that yeah. is truly where we need to we need to go. Is that I guess the question I'm going to throw out to you, and perhaps as the the listeners are are hearing this and they're and they're wondering, okay, this is great, but this seems kind of pie in the sky, in the clouds. I mean, we're literally talking about something that has happened before the foundations of the world, and and you have referenced this already in terms of well. Where, where do I fit into this? Sure. And, th- and that is actually the mm. wonderful, mm. good gospel news of understanding the covenant of redemption. Yes. Is that actually the covenant was made between the Godhead. And so, one, frankly, we can trust it. Word. Because Scripture continually testifies that God is faithful and mm. God is good and God is just and that God cannot lie. Yeah. Right? And so within this covenant, we can trust that it's good and faithful. But we also see... Ephesians 1, the other places, specifically Revelation, we see that we are beneficiaries of this covenant that God has foreordained Uh that we would be saved by Christ, that we would be sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. And so, I mean, that's mind-boggling when you think about it, Uh that before the foundation of the world, God looked at us and he said, well, before John or Jimmy or Justin ever sinned, this is what I'm going to accomplish on their behalf. That's right. And what wonderful assurance does that bring to yeah, us? A lot. And this is what will expand the Old Testament for you, because right. if the God of the Old Testament is faithful to an unfaithful people, and he continues yeah. to pre- preserve his covenant, preserve which we'll explain a little bit later, the Old Testament comes alive because the God of the New Testament who covenanted with Jesus to save you— yeah. What you're realizing is that your assurance is not based upon 
what I have done because I'm not even a party in this. Right. I am the recipient of exactly. it. Exactly. God isn't benefactor, looking, yes. God isn't making a covenant with me to save me. God made a covenant with Jesus to save me. Exactly. So therefore I can't break the covenant because I'm not a party member. Right. I'm just a benefactor. Absolutely. So for us, in our understanding of covenant theology, the covenant of redemption serves as the pattern mm-hmm. for how we understand the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. It guides us in our understanding of those two respective covenants. Right. Who benefits from the covenant of redemption? We've just talked about that. It's the elect. It's right. the, those whom God has chosen. Well, who is it then that's under the covenant of grace? And can I where, just project there? I mean, someone may be brand new to this idea of elect. Well, that's right. language we got from Ephesians, right? We were just using yeah, it, that, right. that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Paul will use the language of election in Romans and other places as well. So yeah, th- there is a people that God the Father has chosen right, in the Son before the world began, those are the people who benefit from the covenant of redemption. But then as we see in time and space, the covenant of works happens. We're going to talk about that more. Jesus fulfills a covenant of works to accomplish, in one sense, in, in the covenant of grace, right, where we are having the merits of Christ and all of these things applied to us by faith. Well, who are the people who are under that covenant of grace? It's those whom the Father elected. It's those who were chosen in Christ. They're under the covenant of grace, and that's where the Spirit is applying the work of Christ to them through regeneration and faith. Yeah. So I just want to um, kind of go back to my original analogy here to kind of help us kind of bring this in a little bit. So as we think about, you know, a movie or a storyline, right? You ever watched a movie where the the movie begins perhaps with like one of the final scenes mm-hmm. and, and then it, yeah. it like flashes back. It's called in media res. Like it's, right. it's an actual term. Right. And realistically, if somebody came to me and they said, I don't know anything about the Bible, where should I start? <laughs> Ephesians one is actually where I'd bring them. And yeah. this is why, because if you actually have in the back of your mind that mm-hmm. the covenant of redemption is the overarching, undergirding thing that is holding together all of the Bible, you're going to look at these obscure stories in with Noah, David, Abraham, yeah. Daniel, whatever, and say... They're all connected. Yeah, they're, yeah. But, but something's going on here it, deeper. And something greater is coming. Yeah, something greater is going to come. Rather than... Because you've seen the end of the movie. Yeah, and, and frankly, <laughs> I think a really practical thing, mm-hmm. guys, that this does for us, understand the covenant of redemption... It prevents us. In fact, I don't think it will allow us to moralize the Old Testament. It doesn't. No. It will not allow it, us to principalize the Old Testament, no. but rather to see that our aim in the Old Testament, when we preach it, when we share it, mm-hmm. when we read it, when we understand it, is to see where does this stand in relation to redemptive historical understanding of how Christ has come to right. accomplish where, the work that God the Father has Where does this stand in relation to Christ? Exactly. Who right. is the point of this? Because... He fulfills the covenant of works in the covenant of grace to accomplish this great covenant of redemption. Yeah, that's right. You know, and and that's what this is about. Yeah. The the whole drama of redemptive history is all about the accomplishment of the covenant of redemption, namely yeah. that the Son would have his people and a new creation inheritance. And we are part of that. Yeah, that's right. The, the great outline of the entire narrative of scripture is the Father plans. The sun accomplishes the, the spirit, spirit applies. applies. Amen. That's right. That is the great outline. Right. And I would even say And we, then we benefit. That's right. <laughs> so uh, we'll get to the we'll get back to that in a minute. I would say to Jimmy's analogy, what really the covenant of redemption does is it gives you the 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 key, the spotlight. It gives you the yep. trail. Because now you have to ask the question, okay, all right. So the scene opens that there's this promise being made. And here's the two parties, and there's the app. There's the one who's going to apply it. Well, how how does it happen? Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, let's start at the beginning. Right. In the beginning, God created. Right. But if you start in the beginning, there's so much confusion. But right. now, if you're like, oh, there's this scene that happened outside of the story right. that's going to govern the story. Yes. So it starts in creation, and there's a fall. Well, then how are they going to fix the fall? We already know well, Jesus is the one who's going to fix it. But how do we get Jesus? Oh, we'll keep watching right. yeah. because the how you get Jesus is the most unbelievable ride that's going to make you trust the God who covenanted to save you more than you could ever believe. And sometimes people will push back 
and say, well, is it appropriate to understand some passage in the Old Testament, whether that's Genesis or 1 Samuel or whatever? Is it appropriate for us to understand it in light of everything that's coming well after it? Well, the, the answer to that is, well, absolutely yes. I mean, as we have been given the privilege of having all of revelation given to us, we use it and we understand any one portion of the story in light of the whole. It would be irresponsible not to. Why would we ever, I mean, like you guys have said, if we know what the movie's about, why would we ever go to one scene and try to interpret that scene ignoring what the whole thing is about in the first place? That's right. We, can't, we should not do that. It would be irresponsible to divorce things and read texts in isolation as though we don't know the end of the story, as though we don't know the main point. Yeah. So I think it's irresponsible exegesis to interpret a passage any other way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good explanation. And another way I would say, which is going to lead us into our other sessions, is that as you're unfolding scriptures, you're walking through it, you're going to start realizing, here's a, just an example before we go into the covenant of works section, when God makes a promise to Adam and Eve of a seed will come, the question is, which child of Eve? How do we know right. for without a shadow of a doubt, we have the right child because God is placing their restoration and mm -hmm. forgiveness upon that child. Yep. So the whole Old Testament is the explanation of this is the right child. That's right. Without and, a doubt, this is him. And how how do we get to Christ as Messiah? I mean, Jesus as Messiah, I should say. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And which changes how you read the Bible because mostly people read it thinking, well, where am I, and how does this apply, and how do I do better? And the Old Testament is saying, oh, no, this is how you get Messiah, and it's mm -hmm. very important you get the right one, because Jesus says, right. you get to the Father through me. Right. He better be the right one. Right. Yeah. And he, yeah, he's the representative. That's right. Yeah. So, guys, we're, we started the movie. We have this crazy scene in the beginning. We're not really sure where it's going to go. We have a basic understanding, covenant of redemption now. And so as we continue to watch this movie, you're going to want to ask, well, how does that actually take place? Work. And that's where we get covenant of works and covenant of grace. That's where the good stuff happens. That's right. yeah. And that's where we're going to head into our next session. So thanks for listening.